So, Steve Parsons, my my dear friend and uh, insurance advisor. Uh, you know, insurance is one of those tough things. I hate talking about it. Um, I've always joked that hey, if you know, when I'm when I go, my wife gets everything, and I don't care. I'm gone. So, what do I care? But. What I learned through taking the executor advisors course was that there are all, you know, you don't just go. The government raises their hands and says, hey, what about us? And they want to be paid. And there's, there's huge taxes involved in, in some of these estates. And, and I started to learn more and more about why insurance at our age is, is important to protect the loved ones and the people, the beneficiaries that we leave behind. So uh, I immediately called Steve and I said, Steve, is there anything that you could talk about uh, involving, you know, the, the seniors, uh, lifestyle, in, insurance, uh, uh, executor information. And he said, yeah, I've got all kinds of great information I can share. So I said, why don't you come up to Collingwood and, uh, and speak to us about it. And, and if somebody wants to get a hold of Steve afterwards, you know, he is in Toronto, but he does come to Collingwood all the time because he loves the lifestyle. He's an avid golfer, and I'm happy to call him my friend. Steve? Thank you, Max. This afternoon, I'd like to provide you with some <clears throat> ideas to reduce taxes and keep peace within your families. Uh, it's a big mouthful there. As a trusted advisor to many families, I will share some real scenarios situations and examples that I've come across in my practice over 26 years. Minimizing probate fees. It is really important to have a current will, a living will covering health and financial powers of attorney. With a show of hands, is everyone's will up to date? Are all their powers of attorneys up to date? Okay, I want to see a whole bunch of hands here. Okay. Not having a will means a person dies intestate. In this situation, the government of Ontario charges probate fees based on your total. Oh, closer. Okay. In in this situation, the government of Ontario charges probate fees based on your total assets left behind. If you have the government write your will, the current government, you might not be happy with what it leaves to your loved ones. Probate fees in Ontario run two hundred and fifty dollars on the first fifty thousand of assets and $15 per thousand of assets you have left over. In many situations, a husband and wife may name each other as executor of their wills. I once witnessed a situation whereby a spouse had brain cancer, underwent surgery, and was basically pleasantly confused. She did not even recognize her husband. This caused tremendous stress in the family, and actually he predeceased her. The problem was that they had never imagined that the two of them would have a health concern at the same time. As a result of this, their kids were having a very difficult time accessing money to help their surviving parent. By naming a child or an alternate executor who can take over the executor duties if your first choice for executor dies, becomes sick, or decides that he or she does not want to be an executor, may be a better option. A way to avoid probate fees can be achieved by considering and utilizing segregated funds. They're known in the insurance industry as guaranteed investment funds and they're only offered by life insurance companies. By naming beneficiaries and even successor owners, this allows these assets to pass the loved ones, to pass to loved ones and future generations without triggering probate fees. Most people ask me, why does this happen? It happens because it's an insurance product. So the government looks at it as there's a benefit to it, there's a guarantee to it, and there's a death benefit guarantee. These investments are separate from the insurance company's general operating assets. So you don't have to worry about the insurance company going belly up. They do have guarantees. It's under Assurus, and Assurus guarantees life policies with cash values, and also annuities, annuity payments, RIFs, and RRSPs. 
One's principal is guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be at least 100% at time of maturity. It's usually 15 years out. They also provide a 100% death benefit guarantee. Now, most people want to get more than 100% on their investment, obviously. In this room, I think everyone would want that. But it is, a, it is a product that will guarantee a base amount for future generations. And if the market values are higher, that will be paid out tax-free as well. I have a handout. I'm not sure everyone has it there, but the, there's a blue sheet there that says uh, Sleep Easy, I believe. On the very back of it, if you could turn it over, I've got an example where I'm comparing estate fees on death of a million dollar investment account. Basically, the comparison is between a mutual fund and a segregated fund, the insurance company's product. If you look at the future value of the investment of a million dollars, right off the top, probate fees in Ontario, being $250 on the first $50,000 and $15 per thousand come out at $14,500. That's a big number. If you look at legal fees and executor fees and accounting fees, I've showed up to the maximum that are usually charged, up to 5%. So you've got $14,500 in probate fees, $50,000 in legal fees, 50,000 in estate uh, executor fees and $2,500 in accounting fees. Hopefully you have accountants, accountants in, the, in the town that aren't as expensive as the ones in Toronto. I'm not sure about that, but I've heard it's up to 250 an hour in Toronto. So the difference between the two scenarios is a savings of $117,000 because you get 100% of your segregated fund investment paid out to your loved ones. It's pretty significant when you look at probate fees. I don't think they'll be going down anytime in the, anytime in the future. Other benefits of segregated funds is that there's an immediate payout of funds. A lot of times clients will tell me it's taken a year to settle an estate. With an insurance product, all we need is a death certificate, proof of age, and we can pay out the funds to your beneficiaries and loved ones. I call this the conversation. It's really important to keep your, your children informed of your final wishes. It's not something everyone wants to talk about every weekend. Dying is really not that much fun, and I'm sorry I have to go last to talk about it, but it, there's two things in life that are guaranteed, taxes and death. If you have children, it's wise to let them know where you keep your will and your living wills for power of attorney purposes. If something happens to your health, you want to make sure that they can make the right decisions concerning you if you're in a situation or in a hospital and you need that right call to be made. Also let them know where you keep your keys to your safety deposit box, um, any codes or um, combinations for a, a safe in the basement. If you're traveling a lot, it's imperative that they can get at funds for you if you need them. Talk openly with your children. This gives you a feel for where they're headed in their careers and will also help you to see how and to whom you will want to leave certain assets. Some children may not be good with money. Others might be financially astute. So when you're doing your planning down the road, think of what you want them to be able to do with the money and maybe put them in touch with a, one of your professionals that you use, maybe an accountant that you trust that can help them in the future. Make sure you review your beneficiary designations on your group insurance. I'm not sure how many people here are still working, but if you are working, group insurance designations are very important to get correct. Um, beneficiaries on tax-free savings accounts, beneficiaries on RRSPs, beneficiaries on RIFs, locked-in income funds, annuities, especially if annuities have guarantees. Some annuities have a 10-year guarantee for payment and you have a named beneficiary. With marriage failures in Ontario, currently around 41%, it would be very embarrassing if an ex-spouse was still left on a, as a beneficiary on an old policy. It would be, yeah, that would be the worst thing you could ever have happen for you and your new spouse. 
Did you know that if your son or daughter is married and they receive benefits from a life policy that you've earmarked for them when you passed away, that if they receive that money, it's received tax-free, they need to put that money in their own account with their own name on it for it to be their inheritance. If not, it becomes part of the family. So if you have disagreements with the odd son-in-law or daughter-in-law, it's one way of making sure that your child gets their inheritance. Many times children hold resentment to their mom and dad if they remarry. They may fear that their inheritance will become reduced by this new person. One of my clients told me that the best recommendation I could give to him was asking him to buy a life policy earmark for the new spouse. He made sure to tell his kids that he was doing this. The minute that policy was put in place and his kids knew it was there, the relationship between him, his new spouse, and the kids was perfect. So that's, that's one thing to consider. Estate equalization considerations. When I talk about estate equalizations, if people have more than one child, they want to make sure they're fair to them, or hopefully they want to, hopefully they want to make sure they're fair to them um, if something happens to them with regards to dispersal of their assets. I'll use an example of a dairy farmer who has a 24-year-old son and a 20-year-old daughter. The son's been working in the dairy farm or at the dairy farm since he was 17 years old. His sister is not interested in the dairy farm, does not want to be on the dairy farm, and does not want to own the dairy farm. So basically, mom and dad, wanting to be fair for both kids, are looking at it and saying, is it really fair that our son has to buy out his sister at fair market value after he's worked all those years in the farm? He came up with a new milking machine that expanded the output. It allowed them to buy more cows, and, the, and the, the farm is doing amazing. So basically, they're, they're looking for a solution on how to fix that. Life insurance can fix that solution. If something happens to the last one, mom and dad, the last person that, that, that goes, a life policy is paid out to that daughter so that the son owns the farm free and clear. What is joint life insurance? And how is it different from joint last survivor insurance? There are two types of joint life insurance. The first type is joint first to die. That means that the life insurance policy is paid out on the first death of two people, usually husband and wife, but there could be other scenarios. A second to die policy or last survivor policy is paid out when the second spouse passes away. This is used for estate planning purposes. If there are any capital gains with property, cottages, um, RRSPs, RIFs, annuities, this type of policy pays out when the last person passes away. One type of policy that you can look at in the form of a joint last to die policy is one that has premium ceasing on the first death. So if, a, if the first person passes away, the remaining spouse doesn't have to be burdened with insurance payments for the rest of their life. The policy is totally paid up, and when the last person passes away, the proceeds are paid out tax-free to the families. In closing, most people buy life insurance for different reasons over their lifetime. Maybe to cover a mortgage, to look after their kids, to erase a debt, to provide income replacement when the kids are young. Policies such as term, whole life, universal life may not meet the needs and objectives as they once did when they were first purchased. Beneficiaries may need to be changed. If you'd like to talk to me about segregated funds or any insurance related matters, I'll be happy to help you out. Are there any questions with regards to insurance? Yes. If you have a registered savings plan, is it true that if you die, they can take up to 53% of it. Any questions? Yeah. That was, if you die with an RRSP, is it true that the government could take up to 53% of your RRSP? And that is true. 
depending on your marginal tax bracket. So there are a lot of people that look at that tax problem as they see it and say, you know, I want to leave a certain amount to my kids, maybe to help them buy their first home, maybe to help out grandkids in the future, and life policies work to help that. See, life insurance is, is paid out on a tax-free basis. The key thing with life, life insurance is you just have to be able to qualify for it. When I talk about joint last-to-die policies, I don't necessarily have to have two people in perfect shape. You can set up a joint last-to-die policy where payments end on the last death. The policy that I referred to a couple of minutes ago saying joint last-to-die with premium ceasing on first death, I would need two healthy people for that. Because what we do is we combine the ages together to come up with a, a combined risk rate, which is usually lower than if you bought an individual policy. So people have big discrepancies in age in their, in their marriages. That's great for them, and it works out well for insurance too. Any other questions about insurance? No. Okay. Thanks for your time, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you, Steve. Um, one of the...